Hello and uh, welcome to my talk. Um, my name is Christoph Vogt. I'm uh, from Hanover, Germany and uh, live there with my family. Um, I spend the majority of my career to work on cloud, uh, cloud native infrastructure and cloud native architectures. And uh, yeah, I used to contribute to um, the Kubernetes release team and Kubernetes related technologies. And also I'm a co-founder of a, a consultancy called Liquid Reply. Um, which is a company, a company dedicated to provide cloud-native solutions uh, to our customers. Usually those are based on um, directly or indirectly um, on Kubernetes. And since almost two years, um, we started doing more and more research on the topic of WebAssembly and uh, tried to discover like, how customers could already utilize um, WebAssembly uh, on top of Kubernetes. And one of the results that we had um, was a Kubernetes operator called KWASM. Um, which prepares Kubernetes nodes in a way that you can uh, yeah, spin up um, WebAssembly applications next to your existing uh, containers. Today, I would like to talk about uh, why we as a consultancy are interested in um, WebAssembly, but this time I would like to explain this in a, a, from a slightly different perspective and address um, a rarely told narrative about WebAssembly which is why WebAssembly could be an ally in uh, creating more sustainable and more uh, energy efficient um, systems. So what you see here is uh, a chart from the Sysdig 2023 Cloud Native Security and uh, Container Usage Report, um, which gives very interesting insights um, about organization utilizing, how they're utilizing their cloud environments. And actually what uh, this um, chart reveals is basically what we experienced from a day-to-day -day base is basically that um, customers notoriously um, under, uh, underuse and uh, um, over, um, yeah, um, underuse their Kubernetes clusters and their existing resources. And um, this data is basically uh, based on like real world customers of millions and millions um, of containers and workloads. And what we can learn from this report are mainly two things like we allocate a ton of resources without actually using them. And uh, the reasons for them are manifold. So the most often excuse that I, or the most um, yeah, often excuse that I hear is like, uh, but we need the resources in case we need to scale somewhere. Uh, sometimes it's just like um, the fact that people don't know about like the things that you can do with Kubernetes. And um, while Kubernetes aim to solve this kind of bin packing problem, um, there seems to be a lot of potential to make it actually more user friendly. And um, just as a remember, um, why do we want to have bin packing? Like to use our resources as efficient as possible. This is direct cost implication as we aim to reduce the number of um, servers, but this also means that it has direct environmental in, uh, implication as every unused machine um, effectively uh, is producing carbon emissions somewhere on the world. So what reality shows is why Kubernetes does have means to build energy sufficient um, systems at scale. Uh, it's actually hard to apply them. So, and with this talk, I would like to discuss what WebAssembly um, as a technology um, offers to create more energy efficient systems. So, it's almost, or it is already the end of this conference, so I assume that you know what WebAssembly is, but nevertheless, this slide, um, because it lists uh, basically um, some, some key aspects of why, why WebAssembly excels um, here, and um, which is or other way around, like the design goals of WebAssembly um, have, have uh, like out of the 14 design, 13 design goals, there are like four very, very prominent ones, which is like the portability, the performance of it, um, language independency, and uh, its security. And in the end, it's exactly those uh, qualities that make WebAssembly a promising foundation for sustainable systems. But in what kind of systems and what kind of areas are we tend to use WebAssembly? and what are the typical applications. What you see here with this chart um, is a result from 2022 uh, State of WebAssembly survey um, by Scott Logic. And this graph shows the distribution of areas where um, WASM finds its application. And what we see are like two really emerging fields which um, uh, are serverless and like containerization. And um, we also hear more and more use cases about like um, applying WebAssembly on IoT uh, for IoT use cases which means that this will be the area where we find uh, potential for um, carbon savings. So does this mean we can uh, reduce emissions just by using WebAssembly? Well, okay, let's uh, step a, um, a little bit back. 
So as we know, a lot of languages are compiling to WebAssembly, but all of them have different, different advantages and um, uh, characteristics. Um, let's have a look at the overall performance of language and see whether we can um, derive some insights from there. So it's, it's very, very likely that you know this picture because it went on Twitter and basically everywhere on the internet and uh, everyone was saying, okay, use C and Rust uh, for your service uh, exclusively. Um, uh, but if, if you read the actual study, it's, it's pretty interesting what it, what it reveals because like only this chart reveals that like there could be some kind of uh, uh, hierarchy um, of, of, of energy efficient um, languages, which is not exactly true. And the, the study also um, tells this, um, and we will see this in a, in a second. And, um, but what it also reveals is that energy efficiency of languages are like directly influenced by the nature of the problem. Um, there's yet another dimension of the study and a very common misconception when um, analyzing energy consumption in software is that it will behave in the same way um, as the execution time of the software does. So in other words, reducing the execution time of a program would bring about the same amount of energy reduction. And in fact, um, the energy equation, like energy equals power times time, um, indicates that reducing time impl implies a reduction in the uh, energy consumed. Conclusions regarding this uh, uh, issue diverge sometimes, uh, where some works do support that energy and time are directly related, but the opposite was also observed, and we will see this basically in um, the next chart, again from the same um, from the same study, and. This table is from the same study, but um, displays the three analyzed benchmarks, basically. And um, the measurements reveal that the energy consumption and time not always um, correlate as expected. Uh, just to take an example, um, I'm looking on the lower left there, um, that TypeScript performed in the binary tree benchmark better than Go in terms of used energy, but Go's execution time is way shorter than, than TypeScript's, actually. But if you consider the, the um, other benchmarks, um, both languages are light years apart, so they, there's no actual correlation. In practice, the runtime characteristics of the final WebAssembly executable depends on several factors, um, such as the maturity of the compiler and support for language-specific optimization, or features just as uh, um, like garbage collection. Therefore, while WASM ensures cross-compatibility for different languages, it's crucial for developers to be aware of the current limitations and the uh, uh, compilation process. Because so many factors are involved, it's challenging to reason about sustainability and performance implications of WASM-based um, yeah, implementations. Um, the next dimension, uh, next you could ask, like, how does the WebAssembly runtime actually influence the runtime characteristics? And there again is another um, study which is um, pretty interesting, um, where um, the, re, uh, the, the energy consumption and performance of, of WASM across languages on multiple runtimes has been um, um, yeah, measured. Um, in fact, what has been measured were, were on um, IoT devices. So the goal was to determine how different source programming languages and runtime environments affect energy consumption and the performance of the, those binaries. Um, the method, yeah, they basically compiled three benchmarking algorithms again from different programming languages. They used um, C, Rust, Go, and, and JavaScript, and compiled them to WASM and run them on uh, two different uh, runtimes uh, on Raspberry Pi, but that's not actually important. Um, so the benchmark problems that I have were like an n-body problem, like modeling orbit to, um, orbiting uh, planets, binary trees, like creating perfect uh, binary trees with a given depth, and a spectral norm, like calculating um, um, yeah, maximum values of a given matrix. And the results in terms of energy usage are more or less in the same ballpark as we saw just in the previous study. And, but in this case, the execution time seems to be generally proportional uh, to the energy consumption. What's interesting, actually, uh, in, in, this, um, in this graph in the, in the um, uh, upper left is that uh, seems, uh, in upper right, I'm sorry, uh, seems to be that C seems to use more memory than other languages. Um, I'm not too sure about this because in the end it's also like up to the implementation. Um, uh, but what, what's the winner here basically is, would be Rust, uh, which uh, seems to use the least amount of, of, of energy. Overall, this language benchmark should be taken with a grain of salt, as I already mentioned, like at least 
my business applications do rarely calculate binary trees or similar problems, so it's always the question um, how, whether we should rely on this. Let's have a look on the execution properties from the runtime perspective, like um, WASMA and um, WASM time have been evaluated, and both, uh, both use roughly the same amount of energy, and also uh, runtime is in the same ballpark. Um, however, it seems to be that um, WASMA seems to use slightly more memory uh, than um, WASM, WASM time. Um, but also here again, when we have a look on language and uh, runtime interaction, we also see no, no real surprise. So what we conclude from this study, at least, is that developers should choose the source programming language wisely to benefit from better performance and a reduction in energy consumption. But it needs to be like uh, in consideration of the actual problem that needs to be solved. Um, overall, the study could not find conclusive results for the choice of the WebAssembly runtime. However, I don't want to say here that there's generally no difference. Um, first, only two runtimes have been evaluated. There are way more runtimes out there. And uh, second, usually we don't choose our runtime for energy efficiency, but actually currently we do, we choose them for, for features, right? Um, let's talk about a different aspect. As we just learned, while it's great to be able to write applications in every language, we still carry the good as well as the bad properties of the language. Like a fast language will still be fast, the language requiring a runtime will still require a runtime, and if our app relies on libraries, they will be compiled as part of the app. Um, These are just the rules. All this influences the binary size of our WebAssembly app. Applications without a runtime will result in WASM modules that are re relatively small, and there are even languages that can compile without any standard library and create um, like the smallest module possible. Um, for this module, uh, um, for this visualization here, I created uh, three categories, which is like compiled languages, um, that uh, where the, the small, uh, the, the size usually is, um, can be reached a couple of kilobytes. Um, there are managed languages with a few megabytes and scripting languages um, that usually have like 10 to 20 megabytes, um, depending on what they actually contain. Managed language, uh, of course, are still compiled. Um, but the compiler output requires a managed runtime. Usually, um, like a common task of this kind of runtime are garbage collection and similar things. Um, in order to let scripting languages, on the other hand, uh, side uh, compile to WebAssembly, uh, the approach is usually to uh, compile the interpreter, which is usually written in C, to WebAssembly, um, and then basically stuff the, the script to this interpreter and um, let it execute within WebAssembly. And this is, this is basically the reason why uh, scripting languages generally have a bigger um, like uh, binary sizes. But why is this even important? As we learned with our endeavors from the container times, transmitting artifacts can cause significant network traffic. Um, a shout out to all the people who are still using uh, Ubuntu images to package their apps. Currently, it looks like that OCI registries will remain with us and uh, will be an important factor in our distributed systems. So um, uh, to yeah, distribute the artifacts uh, closer to the actual worker node. So um, in order to start WASM apps in our systems, we will need to transmit them to the worker. And um, so this is an important factor to consider when we talk about energy efficiency. Um, but nevertheless, it's uh, likely better than um, the average size of a container or virtual machine image, obviously. Okay. So, so much to the characteristics of pure WebAssembly binaries. So, we just learned language performance. While WASM promises near native speed, we must not expect anything faster. And uh, the general language properties still apply. About binary size, the size of a WASM module heavily depends on the source language, um, which is mostly important for distributed systems. About runtime performance, um, while runtime, of course, influences the speed of execution, at least in terms of uh, um, um, uh, scientific research, we couldn't find any, any um, conclusive results here. And uh, as I already said, currently we are living in a world where we are choosing our runtime for features and not necessarily for, for any kind of energy efficiency. Okay. Let's look about the actual features of WebAssembly. Um, so the big promise is that WebAssembly is polyglot and I can write my applications in basically any language. And this was basically one of the initial use cases uh, of WebAssembly to be able to call WebAssembly from JavaScript so that I can um, um, use WebAssembly for the resource-heavy compute. 
So core WebAssembly already provides like the fundamental composition primitives for um, imports, exports, and functions. Um, and with WebAssembly on the server side, we are able to apply this pattern to the backend as well um, without being tied to JavaScript. We can not only author applications in any language that compiles to WASM, but there are also ways to host modules independent of which language they are written in. A developer writing code in a higher level scripting language, for instance, could use high performance code uh, written in a lower language, um, a lower level language. But what about more complex applications that require some uh, complex structures or, or type sharing? So, normal WebAssembly modules are typically built with all WASM compile time dependencies baked into a single binary. If a large application were to support third-party plugins, then likely each WASM plugin will have duplicate dependencies leading to the size and memory bloat and slower downloads. With WASM components on the other hand side, and you heard about this uh, pretty uh, a lot uh, during this conference, uh, where a single application may have the choice of components written in any language, an application will only need to download exactly what it needs and uh, interact with those components um, via a well-defined contract. My app could use the best component for the problem, where the best could mean like the fastest crypto library or the fastest image processing library. Or the best could also mean like the library with the cleanest API or the best suited API. So the defining characteristic will not anymore be the source language, but um, yeah, uh, the, the actual component its capabilities. Um, maybe in future we will even see something like a WASM component hub or something similar, where we are just choosing like the, the component that we, that we like across all languages. For the component model, performance was an explicit design goal, and uh, the performance characteristics that you get from like normal WebAssembly, um, like it was a very important goal to, to retain this, um, this, this like performance um, characteristics and not get worse. According to the component model FAQ, um, there is little to no performance overhead. Unfortunately, it's hard to judge actually because there are not really any benchmarks, and I think it's also a little bit early to, to actually um, benchmark this. Um, but uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I met um, Schiff from Loophole, um, Loophole Labs, and he basically uh, told me from about like an um, alternative approach. So the thing is like that, that um, moving data between host and the uh, WebAssembly module is harder than it should be. And uh, for this uh, reason, Loophole Labs built a library called um, Polyglot, um, which is a serialization framework uh, that's extremely efficient and facilitates um, sending structured data between host and guest languages. And uh, they gave a very nice um, proof of concept um, where uh, they uh, tried to um, substitute um, the uh, Golang regex engine, um, which is known to be very slow. So what they have is a Golang pro program, and they wanted to use Rust's regex engine instead. Um, and uh, yeah, by this they managed to achieve like an um, um, incredible performance gain, basically. Like uh, they created a WASM function, which was able to handle uh, more than 170,000 requests per second, where each request basically was doing a regex, regex replace for um, the 16 kilobyte uh, payload. And um, this is indeed faster than native, where native means like faster than normal Go. And I think this example shows uh, pretty well what's possible by combining language, and that this is a very, a very powerful um, yeah, thing. And uh, I assume that we will see this uh, more and more in the future. But how should we actually run and operate our WebAssembly? Again, let's take a step back. Um, talking about energy efficiency, energy intense systems emit more carbon, so far so easy. But how do we actually estimate the carbon intensity of a given system? So to approach this question, the Green Software Foundation proposes this equation, which distinguishes between operational emissions and embodied emissions. Beware that this is a rate and not a total, like the result is a rate and not a total, um, and this is carbon per functional unit. So just to give you an example, if you have two chat applications and you want to understand their, their um, carbon um, emissions, you, you cannot simply say, okay, um, you cannot simply uh, compare them by, by total emitted carbon um, because you cannot make any assumptions about like the amount of users or the architecture of this chat app. Um, but what you can do instead is to measure like the um, actual carbon, carbon used per minute 
or amount of service used and uh, emitted carbons, therefore. So in any case, there are uh, three ways to reduce carbon in software systems in general, um, which is on the one hand side, use less hardware, like reduce the size of your machines necessary to operate the system or architect your system in a way that it um, yeah, uses fewer machines, um, use less energy, uh, make server consume fewer resources for completing an end user's task. And there's one third thing um, that you can do, which is basically um, do more when the energy supply is green or, or clean and do less when energy supply is dirty. So for instance, you could schedule your, your backup or batch, um, batch processing jobs, whatnot, um, during peak, peak times of solar energy, or um, I don't know, schedule it somewhere where uh, you're sure that um, uh, the workload is operated in CO2 neutral um, data centers. There's a really, really great talk by uh, Henrik Christensen um, from the GoTo Conference 2023 about creating energy efficient uh, software architectures. And I really recommend um, watching this talk. And um, he states one thing that I thought makes really sense to mention here, which is the non-proportionality of energy consumption. Um, to illustrate the statement, uh, let me give you the following example. Like a computer that is completely idle um, spends 100 watts. Being used at 50%, it consumes 180 watts. 100% utilization consumes 200 watts. So this means basically for 50% utilization, we only spend 20 watts. As opposed to from zero to 50%, uh, we spend 180 watts. So this means, means a machine spends a lot of energy by doing nothing. So from an energy efficiency perspective, uh, we should definitely avoid this and keep the machine busy. Um, ideally, in this example, busy between 15 to 100 percent, as we pay unproportionately less energy for the for the amount of work. So, how can we ensure that our machines are actually busy? Um, well, we have to deploy our applications as dense as possible. Um, you remember bin packing, which brings us to multi-tenancy. When we talk about multi-tenancy, we mean running applications in the same shared environment. WebAssembly security profile makes it ideal for multi-tenancy scenarios, given that applications can be fully isolated against each other. By this, uh, or by multi-tenancy, we assume that the applications itself are entirely independent from each other and uh, do not no, relate to each other um, and are not relying on each other. The benefit in doing so is that the value of a system based on long-term average traffic uh, increases and we reduce the cost of running a system based on, on short-term short peak traffic. So we are talking about more efficient usage uh, of hardware, and as a result, cost and energy savings. The challenge here is to keep the delta between average and peak traffic as close as possible. Um, and we are talking about the peak to average gap. And uh, in her talk about uh, serverless functions from uh, Wasn't Day EU 2023, um, Kate Goldenring uh, visualized this concept um, the following way, and uh, thank you that I am um, allowed to use this, this, this graph here. So what you see here are generated random numbers between one and 10, and they are representing the load of a machine. So this is totally made up, it's, it's not no actual load, but it like conveys the idea. In the left graph, uh, we see the load distributions of two tenants on one machine. And in the right graph, we see uh, that four tenants are generating load. Both graphs display the average usage in, in green, you see the line, and uh, the uh, peak usage, um, uh, you see this in red. And like the, the, the distance from each other is like the peak to average gap. So, and what, what we see here is when you look at the left one, you see that the average and peak lines are farther apart and the closer, um, the closer together uh, on the, on the right-hand side. So the more tenants we add on our hardware, the closer the peak traffic gets to the average traffic, which is a very complicated way to say, basically, uh, we are using, utilizing our hardware better. However, I have to admit that this assumes that the usage of these tenants, tenants is uh, totally uh, uncorrelated. Um, so they are being used at uh, given times to the point where their usage is actually flattening out. And um, the second thing that I have to admit that this is assuming that there are no, no daily cycles like night and, and day activity or something like this. Um, 
but I think like the, the concept is, is, is clear. Which brings us to serverless. The serverless model is basically the peak of the multi-tenancy idea. And WebAssembly really excels in the execution of short-lived processes. As we um, already noticed, a lot of companies um, and, and use cases that apply WebAssembly um, actually make use of the serverless model exactly because of this. Um, this allows us to create way less overhead and increase um, like a higher amount of workload density and uh, actually over-provision our machines um, without any kind of um, yeah, uh, negative impl implications for the, for the end user. So you can run thousands of functions on a single machine with, with minimal waste. This makes applications more energy efficient as operational emissions are minimized. As a consequence, this also leads to less required hardware, uh, which in turn means reduced embodied emissions. Um, but, okay, serverless, and uh, we can use WebAssembly on, on, for serverless. But is this all? Um, what else can we expect from, from, from WebAssembly? So there's a project I'd like to call out called, called Wiser. And with Wiser, it's possible to pre-initialize um, your WebAssembly module to basically skip the instantiation for, uh, phase. So it works this way, that it's basically invoking the initialization function of your uh, WebAssembly module. It's snapshotting this and the, the, the memory state, basically, and it's creating a new um, WebAssembly module out of it. So as a result, you can take this new module and uh, basically um, start the application. And as the memory is already initialized, this is, um, yeah, you profit from a decreased um, startup latency. Obviously, the improvements uh, that, that Wiser can give you um, depends on how much you need to initialize. Uh, um, and uh, like the improvements that you can actually expect are... Um, yeah, you, can't, you cannot expect any improvements if you're not initializing anything. So a hello world function will probably not, um, not give too many improvements. According to the GitHub uh, page, um, some benchmarks show something between uh, 1.35 to uh, six times faster instantiation and initialization with Wiser, um, depending on the, on the other workload. Um, Another future work, and uh, I, I'm pretty happy that I learned uh, uh, at this conference that uh, companies are already uh, utilizing this. So there's a company called um, Golem, which is basically using um, this uh, snapshotting functionality of, um, of functions in order to uh, yeah, create a snapshot at any given time, which um, means they are able to, um, to uh, deschedule, to shut uh, the, the running function down and reschedule it somewhere else and um, yeah, basically proceed where the actual processing stopped. And um, I think at least this, this, pros, um, this, this, this concept could be used, for instance, um, on machines that are solar powered, which means, okay, do processing whenever uh, the sun is shining and as soon as it's getting dark outside, a higher level scheduler could basically um, like uh, snapshot it, shut it down the function and reschedule it once it's uh, sun shining again. Um, to wrap things up, WebAssembly is still subject to language limitations. We must not assume energy efficient systems just by compiling apps to WebAssembly. Uh, actually, we can, we can get even worse. Um, we can improve efficiency by combining high level languages with low level languages for performance critical tasks um, using the component model and similar strategies. And uh, the most potential for creating energy efficient systems relies on opportunities for alternative operating models of um, uh, like serverless. Um, I think we have not yet reached the full potential of WebAssembly, but there's uh, probably a lot of things that will, um, that will come in the near future. Um, before I'm ending my talk, uh, I would like to thank uh, a couple of people namely uh, Liam, Kate, Sven, and Bailey, who all helped me at various uh, stages uh, preparing this talk. And um, yeah, with this I would like to conclude and uh, thank you very much. I'm not sure about the time, but uh, I would take questions given the fact that I'm the last talk. I think it's good. <laughs> Six, minutes. Six minutes, okay.
I mean, in fact, you have, you have um, like just by bin packing, you have, of course, um, other things. Like the, the, the more applications you put on a machine, um, the more other problems you can potentially get. I mean, the no noisy neighbor problem might be one of them. Um, I don't have a study on this uh, right now, but um, yeah, um, the thing is that uh, WebAssembly runtimes and uh, also like higher order um, hypervisors that you that you could use are able to basically uh, tame uh, the the resource usage that um, that that your functions and your your workloads use, and um, I think this is one mean to 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 mitigate this. Does this answer the question? So with a component model, uh, it will add, uh, add up, right? So let's assume you have a component written in JavaScript. Um, if you use this JavaScript component, of course, this will add up to your, um, to your new WASM module. So it definitely adds up. Or Could you ship one copy of that runtime? Uh, sorry? Could you just ship one copy of that runtime? A copy? Ah, so, so you mean like in, in case I have two modules, both JavaScript, that I'm sharing the runtime? I'm not sure whether this is possible. It would be nice. I, I hope people thought about it. <laughs> in the future, maybe. I, I, I'm, I'm really not sure. I, I don't know about the uh, um, details there. You can do that today? Okay, cool. That's true, that's true. So right now, uh, Lambda, as far as I know, is uh, using Firecracker, so like actual like virtualization, uh, which in fact has a uh, cold start time. And um, yeah, during the, uh, due to the characteristics of, of WebAssembly, you can start even uh, faster. But this is also what, what um, the Wiser project that I just presented is basically addressing. So you can minimize the, the startup time by like pre-initializing and um, yeah, have a minimal cold start time. All right, thank you so much.